everyone. We're going to tag team this talk right now because I wanted to welcome you all to Garfield. How many people here are here for the first time? Wow! That's great! Awesome! Welcome to Garfield! I hope you enjoy your time here. We will be playing some Yinyu favorites for you, Schubert, and Brahms, and Mahlers. And we also have concerts next week. If you're interested in coming for our Arts Duke weekend, we have concerts Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Fridays at 5, Saturdays at 5, and Sundays at 2. But we also have really great meals paired with those. So if not for the music, come for the food, because it's excellent. <laughs> and another uh, fascinating thing about next week is we'll be premiering and we'll be closing out our 50th anniversary season. So we'll be not premiering, but playing an opera that was written for our 50th anniversary. Um, it is based on the life of Christine Herder, who was the woman that owned the property and bequeathed it to Luca and Arlene and Chaco. And it's a chamber opera with soprano, baritone, and us, which is awesome because this space really allows the sound to just flood over and take over you. So if you're interested in that, and then our summer starts June 30th, and that's 10 straight weeks of concerts on Saturday and Sunday. So we hope you'll come back and enjoy some concerts here. Thanks. So the first piece on the program is by Schubert. Um, this is his Arpeggione Sonata. And um, when I think of Schubert's music, the first word that comes to my mind is charming. His music is very charming. He was known for writing leader or songs. And, uh, but he didn't, um, he didn't live a charmed life. He was born outside of Austria in the suburbs uh, to a very poor family. His father taught him the violin from an early age. He um, started composing, but he never really um, gained a lot of, of attention from his composing. Um, I think it was well received, but he never really in his lifetime um, found the fame that I think he did <laughs> years later. Um, he uh, also, while well, he was ostracized because he stood just a few inches above five feet, mm -hmm. and he died at the age of 31. Um, his, let's see, uh, there are accounts, varying accounts of how he died and why, um, but one account said that uh, his body was covered in mercury um, to make, uh, to try and heal some of the symptoms that he was having. So I think, you know, he, he lived during the golden age of music, but maybe not so um, the medical field. Um, so the respected Beethoven met him, uh, met Schubert in, in uh, 1822, and um, this was in Vienna, and uh, they, they sort of were acquainted, but it wasn't until Beethoven was on his deathbed that he was studying Schubert's music and said, um, truly the spark of divine genius resides in Schubert. Um, but the irony is that Schubert died a year later. <laughs> um, so this is his Arpeggione Sonata, um, written towards the end of his life, though I guess if you die at age 31, most everything you write is gonna be towards the end of your life. Um, so um, anyway, it's in A minor, it starts off um, kind of maybe dark, but as always it ends in maybe one of the most charming ways of any piece I've ever heard. So, hope you enjoy.
particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, it attracted people from all over, artists, writers, philosophers, and especially musicians, because it was the city of music. And Gustav Mahler was one of those musicians who came to Vienna, he studied there, had a wonderful career in Vienna. He ended up becoming the conductor of the Vienna Opera and the Vienna Philharmonic and composed many uh, primarily symphonic works. But this particular piece, he composed while he was still at the Vienna Conservatory. And I want everyone just to take one moment to think about what you were doing at the age of 16. <laughs> and I tried to do it. It was really difficult because, of course, it was a long time ago. But mostly because I don't recall doing anything remarkable <laughs> while I was 16. And he composed this wonderful piano quartet. Now he probably intended to have at least three or four movements, but like most young teenagers, I think he was just too excited to move on to the next thing. And he had all sorts of great ideas for other compositions, and so he ended up only completing this one movement. And what strikes me about this piece is that it's just so dark and full of foreboding. <laughs> and you could maybe chalk it up to teenage angst. On the other hand, it may have been a reflection of what was going on in Vienna at the time, which was full of turmoil. They were, go they were going through economic depression. Their stock market had collapsed three years earlier. And there was just a lot of uncertainty. And maybe all of that is reflected in this piece. So Mahler never published this during his lifetime, but his wife found it among his papers after he died, and fortunately, she had it published. Because it turns out that this is the only chamber work that Mahler ever wrote that exists today. And we're just very lucky that it's a piano quartet. So this is Mahler's one movement piano quartet.
a decade before uh, this piece, before Mahler's time, Johannes Brahms um, announced his arrival in Vienna, where he was to settle, um, which, as Teresa explained, was, was sort of the Western music capital of the world um, at that time. Uh, Brahms moved there, and the first piece that he wrote was this piano quartet in G minor that you're about to hear. Um, Clara Schumann was at the piano, um, and a, great, a very famous quartet at the time, the Helmsberger Quartet, uh, performed it, uh, members of the quartet, and at one point they were reading, they read it through with Brahms at the piano, and when they finished, the violinist jumped up and he, he, he proclaimed, the heir to Beethoven is here. Um, so it was, this piece was a very big deal. Um, if you don't know it, it's, it's uh, Opus 25 G minor. Um, it may sound familiar to you anyway. Um, it's a huge piece. And we'll be playing the second and the fourth movements uh, today. If you want to hear the whole thing, you should come back in the summer <laughs> or in the fall. Uh, we play it once in the summer, I think twice in the fall. Um, and it's the type of piece that, uh, you know, even if you've already heard it, you should listen to it again because you'll like it even more the second time and the third time, and we've probably heard it hundreds of times, and we still love it. Um, so we, we'll be playing the second movement and the fourth movement. The second movement is an intermezzo, um, obvious from the title, and it is constructed in an ABA form. So it's a scherzo and trio, so you'll hear two outer sections that are the same, the same music in the outside, or very similar, and then an inner section, kind of a sandwich. Um, and something really interesting about this movement is that it is constructed sort of from the accompaniment and it's all tied together in the especially in the outer sections by constant eighth notes throughout but Brahms disguises these eighth notes he passes them around all the, the different instruments and sometimes they're constant and sometimes they're arpeggiated um, so I just want to show you a couple examples of this if you're if you want something to listen to and it, it's not necessary to know this, but uh, there's something subliminal about it at the same time. So it starts out with the cello just going. And then you'll hear the, the melodies going on above it. I'll pass that to the viola, who will continue that. He'll pass it back to me. I'll pass it to the piano, back to me. And then we'll get to a part where we have something a little different. Um, Fitz and I, at 33. Mm -hmm. It's like this. So that type of, of uh, changes it up a little bit. Um, the piano has all kinds of different ways that, that he changes it up. Can you demonstrate one of these arpeggiated ones? And he goes even further disguising this by, by um, combining the, the constant eighth notes, which is in, in a, a nine eight pulse, which is sort of sounds like triplets. There's three to a grouping. He combines that with duples at the same time, which sounds like this. So do you hear the threes and the twos at the same time? It's uh, very cool <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, so, so that's this movement. It's sort of an enigma, this movement. It's very mysterious. Um, it's not necessarily what you would expect at any, any given time. And then the next movement that we'll play today is the finale, which is the most famous um, of the movements. It's, it's called Rondo alla Zingaresi, which means gypsy rondo. And it's very flashy. It's, uh, it's kind of like the musical equivalent of, of uh, fireworks. Um, and this movement was constructed in a, as it says in the title, a rondo form, which means um, sort of similar to the ABA in the intermezzo, it's an A, B, A, C, A, B, A, F, the E, whatever. <laughs> so so you'll, hear, you're, you'll keep hearing the themes coming back interspersed with other themes. And that's a very standard form in Viennese, uh, you know, traditional Western classical music. Uh, but Brahms does really interesting things with this where the A form that you'll hear first is in its own little ABA form. So there's a mini miniature ABA within the A form and then you get the B, then the A again, and then you go to the C, which is this big, totally contrasting middle section, which is also in its own ABA form. 
So it's kind of, I was thinking about this, it's kind of like, uh, you know those triangle puzzles where you, you draw the three big triangles and then you, if you look closer, you realize there's all these little triangles in between? That was kind of what struck me about, about this movement. But uh, two very, very interesting movements and come back again and hear the whole work. Thank you. 